What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode of the Smoking Tire is brought to you by Vivid Seats. You know, we all love a night out, whether it's seeing our favorite band in person, going to a race, or being there in the crowd to cheer on our favorite team. With Vivid Seats, you can attend the concert, show, race, or sporting event of your choice at a great price. Vivid Seats is the top source for tickets for all the live events you want to go to. You can sort by price or look for seats in the section or row of your choice. To make things even better, Vivid Seats is giving listeners an exclusive promo code for new customers to receive 10% off your first purchase with Vivid Seats to save them even more money. Go to the App Store or Google Play and download the Vivid Seats app. Use promo code Higher for 10% off your first purchase with Vivid Seats. Every purchase is backed by a 100% buyer guarantee. From the biggest concerts and games to the hottest theater and more, Vivid Seats has it all. Download the app and enter promo code TIRE for 10% off your first purchase with Vivid Seats. Make a memory that lasts a lifetime. And let Vivid Seats help you get to your favorite live event. That's 10% off with code TIRE when you download the Vivid Seats app. Uh, We are also brought to you by Continental Belts. When you're under the hood, you ever notice how often you see Continental Belts? There is a reason for that. Continental is one of the world's largest original equipment suppliers for the automotive industry. Automakers around the world insist on Continental for original equipment belts. Uh, The U.S., all the big three, BMW, Volkswagen, over 30% of all new vehicles sold in North America. You know what that says? It says Continental knows original equipment because they are original equipment. Continental's OE Technology Series Multi-V belts for the automotive aftermarket are precision engineered for perfect fit, form, and function with a true OE pedigree. They're the belts engines already know, so you can confidently spec Continental's Multi-V belts. There's one for 98% of the vehicles on the road today. You might not know it, but Continental is also a leader in automotive technology, electronic components for things like autonomous driving and accident-free zones. That focus on innovation is in every product they make, including the OE Technology Series aftermarket belts. Check them out. Just check them out. That's all we're asking. Just check them out. And lastly, we're brought to you by Rad Power Bikes. This is a consumer direct electric bike company producing five unique models of electric bicycles. Because Rad Power Bikes is a consumer direct brand, buyers get a premium electric bike without paying the huge markups caused by dealers and third party retailers, priced at often less than half of the price of comparable bikes on the market because dealer and retail markups are completely cut out. On top of their already awesome price, This coming Cyber Monday, which is November 26th, Rad Power Bikes is making it even easier to get people riding. There are deals on all models of electric bikes with up to $400 off per model. One day only sale on Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday also includes free shipping on all electric bikes to the lower 48 states. Save you some extra cash there. At 750 watts of power, all five models have the most powerful motor an e-bike can have while maintaining a street legal status. No license, registration, or insurance required. You can finance your bike for as low as 0% APR. Just about $100 a month can get you riding. All five models will reach 20 miles an hour with zero pedaling. All five models give riders the choice to ride pedal three with the throttle, utilize five levels of pedal assist for added boost, or any combination of the two. You can travel between 40, uh, 20 and 40 miles on a single charge. I've ridden these things. They are really fun. You can go quite a bit faster than you can go on a normal bike, and you can use them as fully uh, under power so you can get to work or whatever without being all sweaty from pedaling. Uh, visit www.radpowerbikes.com slash podcast. That's radpowerbikes.com slash podcast to learn more, and don't forget to shop their Cyber Monday sale on November 26th to save big. Okay, on this episode of the podcast, uh, I interview Michael Dweck. Uh, Michael is the director, producer, writer uh, of uh, the new documentary, The Last Race, which uh, focuses on uh, a period of time covering Long Island's last oval track. And right now you're probably going, 
Long Island has an oval track? Yeah, they do. And in fact, they used to have a lot more of them. Uh, this one, Riverhead Raceway, is the last one left. Uh, the owners are aging, but very committed. And the cast of characters that can be found there every weekend uh, when they race is uh, unbelievable. It's a great interview. Michael Dweck on the Smoking Tire Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm flying solo today. Zach has a, a gig, but I'm here uh, in Studio A with Mr. Michael Dweck, the director, uh, producer, writer, kind of one man show sort of deal of well, the last race. Well, I had a, I had a, you know, a cinematographer with me too. So, was it literally? It was, was it, is it a crew of two? Was yeah, it that much. Crew two, and it's a meta sound guy thrown in it once in a while. Oh man! So yeah. you you kind of you kind of work on the uh, on the budgets that we work on. <laughs> we're in the same. We're, we're playing in the same field. <laughs> Pretty much. The uh, called intimate filmmaking. Yeah, right. The uh, the film, the last race, seems uh, real cool. I have uh, I have not gotten to check it out yet, but I did watch the the trailer, and I can relate to all of these sort of concepts the encroaching uh corporate sprawl on the the small business and the and the race the, you know racetracks getting shut down and and the the mean people it's like caddyshack the yeah. mean people in suits taking over you know bushwood i call it galloping rot <laughs> yeah it. exactly yeah. so this uh, this film sort of uh, sort of starts around the fact that there were once many racetracks in uh, in long island that's right is yeah. that where you're from I am. I'm from a town called Belmore, Long Island. Oh, yeah. And I was raised next to a racetrack, which was in Freeport. The first racetrack ever in the country. Was in Freeport? Freeport, 1927. Wait a minute. Not yeah. the first racetrack first in the country. Ever in the country. Well, but ever. here in Los Angeles, we had racetracks before that. Before 1927? No mm -hmm. way. No way. The Los Angeles, Grand, uh, the Santa Monica Grand Prix ran look, from look 1908 up. to 1912. Is that a racetrack, though? Well, they used a street circuit. That's different. They had street. board tracks here. Yeah, well, there was actually another. Well, there was a race circuit um, in Long Island. Um, it was a Vanderbilt Cup that mm -hmm. ran from 1908 to 1911. Okay. And that was Cornelius Vanderbilt trying to promote racing in general, the car, the auto industry in general. Yeah. So that might have been around the same time. But a formal race track, an actual- Like with oval, asphalt and- yeah. oh, Okay. Well, dirt, well, it was dirt at the time. Uh, but a dirt track, a uh, quarter mile dirt track, uh, the first one, 1927. And that, which was that racetrack? Freeport Stadium. There was a boxing ring in the middle. Uh huh. There was a, uh, a a running track beyond that. In the middle of it was a soccer field, and on the outside oh, wow, was they a really, racetrack. They really layered this thing <laughs> deep, didn't they? <laughs> they did. A little multi-purpose facility. Well, that's all it was to do in the town. I mean, think about it. Yeah. Bo boxing has a lot to do with, with racing, I have to say, so that was a good idea. Boxing has a lot to do with racing? Were you, well, were you being sarcastic? Or no, it's kind of true. Well, I would say bullfighting, but boxing is pretty close. Well... Because you're, uh, you know, it's um, it's violent, it's um, it's interesting. There's an underdog, there's a protagonist, an antagonist. I mean, it's very, very similar. Mm. And uh, so that's. Did why you I, grow up going to races there? I did twice a week. Tuesday, really? Tuesday and Saturday, I'd never missed a race unless it was raining. But that's where I was from four years old till eighteen. I was at Freeport Stadium until they knocked it down. They put a BJ's wholesale. How exciting! That's the story. That's the story of like every racetrack, right? They knocked it down and put yeah. a Costco or put a mall or put a always. Yeah, there yeah. were there were forty. I mean, the first what I tell you in the first part of the film, the first moment of the film, is that um, uh, you know where where uh, Charles Lindbergh took off from. Uh, they paved that over and built the first shopping mall, the first interior shopping mall, Roosevelt Field. Uh, where that was oh, from. God, so that, that tells a lot about, I hate like, Roosevelt Field. It's horrible. <laughs> I'm from New York as well, top. so I'm familiar with uh, with yeah, some of these places. Are you a Long Island boy? No, I'm a Westchester boy. Okay. I, grew up, I grew up in Rye. So oh, Rye not, is Rye Playland. Not, yes. Still Which there. Which is still standing. Yes. Still there. For those who don't know what that is, it's a fairly terrible amusement park, but probably best known for the site of the Zoltar machine in the movie in Big. Big. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, they had um, the Dragon Coaster, which mm -hmm. was a, a pretty right. well-known roller coaster, right. and uh, it's one of the oldest, mm -hmm. I think 1922, 24 mm -hmm. maybe, they built that thing. Right on the water. Incredibly sketchy. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> yeah. When you're a kid, that thing is real sketchy. That roller coaster. But sketchy is good. Sketchy is thrilling. Makes you feel alive. It does. Like when you're track. when you're you know when you're young, it's the G forces and and mm -hmm. all those things of roller coasters. When you're older and you realize it's not uh you know that big, mm -hmm. it's the sketchiness is really from the age yeah. of the wood, you know, and the and the and the look the screws and the look the on track. the kid's face yeah. who's running the thing and the, yeah, <laughs> you know? and the parents crying. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Call people a on that roller coaster, oh, that's what you know, they it stand fun. up. They stand up, and that's the end. Well, that's, that's the game a, that's over. It makes it fun. I mean, just like the in the you know in the movie. Well, you have to see the movie, but in the movie you see there's a scene where a guy's almost completely 
engulfed in flames. I, that's in the trailer as well. It's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty brutal. It's pretty brutal. Sixty-five percent of his body. Completely yeah, burned. Oh, there and there it is, right there on the screen. Right? Yeah, it's in, it's in your uh, your rotating. Jimmy White Jr. Yeah, what's his name? Jimmy White Jr. What a racing name. Whew. That Jimmy is Jimmy White Jr. Jimmy White Jr. A lot of juniors and seniors in the film, but he's, yeah, uh, he's a guy. So, burned sixty-five percent of his body in the hospital for two months. Gets out of the hospital that first Saturday. Race with racing racetrack again. That's crazy. And that's normal. Are you a, are you a race fan, a lifelong race fan, or is it is it more of a of a, a story about you know your town and or in your area than than about racing? Yeah, I'd say it's more a story about community. So I'm, all my all my work, my photography work, and my uh, and and this film and my next film are all about um, communities on the edge of extinction, and that's something I'm very concerned about. It's about uh, losing communities to uh, to you know commercialization. Yeah, you read the Amazon thing today? I did. I did. That's I what exactly they, they need a billion and a half dollars to that. move to New York. We need that's, that. Let's really draw them yeah. to it. To New York this. hasn't changed enough lately. We have <laughs> the population of New York's increased a million over the last 10 years. That's crazy. One I million. grew up in Atlanta where it went from, you know, mm -hmm. two million to yeah. eight million or something. Well, you know, New York and, is moving down there. Yeah, that's right. Why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, So where did all did all these racetracks just get just get? mowed over and Dude. didn't go on that's yeah, it's, it it's pretty easy to mow them over that just asphalt i mean the when i started to shoot i was shooting photography at that racetrack at riverhead for five years in 2007 to 2012 and what started as 100 percent dense forest and farmland it's the cauliflower capital mm -hmm. of the world it says on the sign as you enter riverhead by the time i had finished photography in 2012 almost all the trees were down and all the farmland was gone um, and that's why I decided to, to spend time uh, memorializing the track before it was gone. And, when it, and then the five years that ensued from 2012 to 2017, what I saw was across the street, there was one little patch of trees left that was mowed down. They built a 200,000 square foot Costco crossing the racetrack, right across. Next to the racetrack, they illegally stripped down 14 acres of trees and uh, and put a shop at 100,000 square foot Christmas tree store right up to the edge of the racetrack, to the fence of the racetrack is the asphalt. Um, and then on that same street, there's two Walmarts. They couldn't, one Walmart wasn't enough, so they built a super Walmart. So this little tiny town was decimated in a matter of five years. That is sad, but kind of inevitable. You know, well, is it? If you don't, if you don't understand the importance of things like this in your community, because it, you know, take this this racetrack, you know, what it's about is working class people that have, you know, really tough jobs during the week. They go home, they work on their race cars every single night, straight through the winter, um, for the chance to, on a Saturday night, um, to win basically a $7 trophy. But what they get more than that is that they get dignity. Yeah. Um, they get a, a lot of glory people. in that $7, seven yeah, dollar trophy. 2,000 people yeah. cheering your name. You get announced by the announcer. Yeah, you're a guy who's like a plumber during the week, right. and then you're a rock star You yeah. know, when you get there. And, and I know what's, how that what's goes. the value of that? I've stood on a podium a couple times. It is, it is it feels riveting. Great. Even when there's like two dozen people there, it still feels it awesome. It feels great. Yeah. And then you have fans that come in the, in the in the pits after the race, get your autograph. Imagine you're getting a plumber giving an autograph. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's you, cool. put on the, you put on the suit. You put on the suit, you yeah. get in the car with the stickers on it. And you, you know? change, but you yeah. transform. I, I watch people, I watch, even the owners, the owner's 87 years old. Through the filming, they both had strokes. They both broke their hips. They, every Friday, they put on the NASCAR uniforms, drive from New York City to Riverhead, yeah, six, 60 miles. They, open, they sleep at a Holiday Inn, next morning get up eight o'clock, open the beer stand, that's from the 40s, with a block of ice, open the hot dog stand, open the ticket booth, open the gates to the pits, and like Barbara says in the film, you know, most of our friends that retired die. Yeah. And we have youth. <laughs> and they mean it because I watch them transform. Them and all the drivers, they go from old people, 87 year old, to kids when they're at that racetrack. It's a very, it's a very beautiful thing to watch. Is it, um, but you said multi-generational, so is it there, is. Is that there, are there kids and grandkids there, there to, to, to pick up behind them? There are. You have, well, not behind Barbara and Jim. Uh, Barbara and Jim, they have three daughters. Uh, none of them want to get into the racing game. Um, are they itching to s well, sell? Well, it's worth $10 million, the last piece of land left in that town, undeveloped. So even when I was filming there, there was always a knock on the trailer door on, on Saturdays. For a developer would always come by saying, Hey, hi, 
Barbara and Jim, I want to buy the racetrack, and they just say, get out! Yeah. Not interested. The same developer or new developers, developers every time? Oh, all different developers. The guy next door, of course, was the most aggressive. He's in the yeah. film, golfing. The one on the golf course, yes. Yeah, Marty Berger. He's yeah. great. Yeah, he the wanted, he said, I just want to expand, I want to take my mall, and I just want to expand it to where you are. And he said, I'm it's, very patient. It's so weird because malls are dying, too. Malls are dying. Well, you that's know, what you're going to have left. You're going to have left just these You're just going to have carcasses malls. of malls, yeah, right? That's like, right. Like, who's building fucking malls right now? Like, what just are you doing with- More, you know, more greedy developers. Yeah. You know, but you realize when, once these things are gone, once, you know, it's not just only about racetracks, but once you have places like this where the community can gather, not here anymore, then what do you have left? What do they do? Well, they, st they stay at Walmart every day and just, I don't know, shop and get home and play video games. Here, you know, you're building a race car- you have a, th a father teaching a son how to build a car. And at 13 years old, you're legally allowed to race a race car on a, any racetrack in this country. At 13, you can't, yeah. you can't get a driver's license no, I know. or a permit, I, but out, you can race at 100 miles an out hour. Here, uh, do, you, do you live out here now, or do you live, no, still I live, live in back New York, east? I come out here quite a bit. So out here, you know, um, we have a lot of kids who yeah. race. I mean, yeah. a lot. It's really, you know, especially because we have uh, a lot of wealthy parents yeah. that can enable that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's I know a kid who, who does not have a driver's license who was racing Lamborghinis. Yeah. And, I mean, forget, forget you know, Different beater Riverhead. old Chevys, you know, in <laughs> Riverhead. I'm talking about about racing Lambos really? at yeah wow. in Vegas at Willow Springs like wow. for real like and that's you know it's not I don't want to say that that's a common story but like that's just that happens yeah. like that happens a bunch I had um um just sitting in that chair last night a gentleman named Ryan Finney who's who races IndyCar mm -hmm. and he was driving uh, cars at 14 and 15 yeah. proper proper race cars before he had a driver's license you yeah. betcha yeah where else can you do that? That's a lot of fun. Well, California is a good place to do it for yeah. sure. I mean, you can you can race go karts at seventy miles an hour at seven years old. Yeah, and I and, mean, and they do encouraging that, and they do, and they yeah. should. It's yeah, awesome. They should. They should. Um, the uh, the are you into cars at all? I am. You are. Mm -hmm. What do you drive? Cars. What do you drive? Well, believe it or not, now in New York, I don't drive a car. Yeah. So, but I used to restore cars all the time. Oh, e yeah? English cars. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Glutton for punishment. Yeah. <laughs> well, those SU carburetors. But I used to, uh, I restored everything from, my first car was an MG. Okay. MGB 76, then I restored Austin Healey's, then old Jag, one, you know, one SK 120s, 140s. And gradually moving up in values, yeah. Well, I started, it. my father gave me $20 to buy a car, so I went, bought a junker, and then yeah. started restoring them, keep buying them with a nicer car, go build one. Yeah. So Do you have a race? I did. Mm -hmm. What'd raced. you race? I raced Formula Fords. Oh, really? Uh huh. Yeah, for a little while until I ran out of money, which was pretty quick. An expensive hobby. That's a hobby. I raced in Bridgehampton. Oh yeah, we hear a lot which about is now a golf course. I hear a lot about Bridgehampton. Right, perfect example. It's a great golf course. Yeah, why not? Here in um, in LA, we had so many. Yeah. Race tracks as well. I mean, we had a, a we had a Beverly Hills. There was a race yeah. track in Beverly yeah. Hills, Santa Monica. I mean, all Santa you know, and you know the very famous Riverside that yeah. that everyone talks about all the yeah. time. Paramount, mm -hmm. which just uh, just burned to the ground, yeah, that's right. um, was the first place that uh, Carol Shelby ever raced a car. Wow, really? Was uh, up in Malibu, yeah, Paramount wow. Ranch Raceway. Incredible. Yeah, it was an amazing place. But they're important to towns. I mean, they you know the the communities come together like a church. But you ever right. find that they're they're important to towns, and yet they are always fighting with the towns. Well, towns don't like them because they're noisy. But yeah. look at it; they were there first. <laughs> when I always, you, you know, when you strip all the trees down and you stop building condos. That's what happens; it gets noisy. Totally. And we, you know, you I'm sure you're familiar with Laguna Seca. You betcha. Laguna Seca was there first. You These betcha. neighbors move in; they start bitching about the yeah. sound, and now it's heavily sound restricted. Yeah. Um. And and I, we hear this over and over, where where the the racetrack is there first. The neighbors move in, and the neighbors start complaining, and now the na now the racetrack's got to comply yeah, with it's it. It's a beautiful sound, though. It is a beautiful sound. They should just learn to appreciate it. It's got a it. great carry, you know? It does. It's the the uh, the ovals, it's kind of sort of contained. You know, the road courses, yeah. well, the, the banking kind of, like, keeps it in a little bit. Yeah, but they don't know what they're missing. I know. I mean, if they experience it once, that's what I'm hoping with the film, because I, I, I welded 20 cameras onto these race cars on purpose, mm -hmm. so that, and I lost a lot of them, of course, but I want, I welded a camera. Do you camera. have a camera graveyard sort of on your oh, wall? Yeah, we do. <laughs> smashed, melted, you know, lenses that are melted into two. Yeah. But what I did was I wanted, it, I wanted people that weren't familiar with racing to understand what it felt like, not to necessarily be an audience member, but what it felt like to be a car, and what it felt like to be a driver. So yeah. by doing that, well, I weld cameras onto bumpers, and fenders and this type of racing you're allowed to make contact 
Yeah, they don't you even know. care. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of rubbing. A lot of rubbing. Because this is, you know, you talk about you talk about uh, stock cars in the sense of a uh, uh, NASCAR. Mm-hmm. These are those are not stock cars. No. Those are tube frame cars that have headlights, stickers, and whatever. In yeah. in the, the like at Riverhead, these are stock cars. These are like yeah. Caprices and are. Crown Vics and exactly Monte Carlos is. and those stuff. Are, and those are the three cars, the most popular cars you name right there. Yeah, Caprice, Crown Vic, Monte yeah. Carlo, right? Mm-hmm. Forty two hundred pounds you have to weigh. Yeah. Minimum, right? Minimum. It's a minimum, minimum. of 200 pounds. That's a and what is it? Car, is it a quarter man. mile oval? A quarter of a mile. Yeah. 30 cars. That's crazy. miles an hour. Quarter yeah. mile oval. Do they even put big motors in them? They just oh, yeah. they literally run them stock, don't they? It, well, they're stock, but they're big block. They're eights. Yeah, but like but, they don't put like big crazy race no, no, motors no. in them, no, right? They they're, 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 pay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're basically like... They're they're one step removed from demo derby cars, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty much. much. I mean, they're yeah. When somebody gets taken into a wall, you know. Well, they're caged up. This. You know, they're, they're caged, caged up, up, but but they're dangerous. They're not like I think these are a lot more dangerous than NASCAR cars. These guys I'm are crazy. sure. These guys are nuts. Yeah. Yeah, which is cool. That's what makes it the same. The cars haven't changed since 1970. Yeah, they really haven't. All the people. Yeah. Did you see a lot of uh, in the in the trailer at least? It implies that there's uh, quite a bit of. Fighting that goes on well, in about, the after up. the race in the yeah. It's about settling up. Yeah. Well, you take somebody into a wall. They, it's not an accident. They're good. They know what they're doing. Yeah. You spin a guy. You're gonna pay for it in the pits. Yeah. And then the next day, you're all friends. You need a carburetor, a crankshaft. They're there for you. It's very unusual. It's so crazy what happens when you get into a race car, and then when you get out of it, and you take what happened on the track kind of with you. You know, it's it's but really, it's but it's, it's, it's it is dangerous. I mean, you could you know you if your ego, you know, overtakes your brain, you know, you could cause someone some serious injury. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> There's a four thousand chunk piece, four thousand pound chunk of metal. Yeah. How and, long did you follow the the track and the and the for was it a, well, a whole season of racing? Uh, no. Well, it looks like a whole season, but I I followed it for I filmed for two and a half years at the track. Oh wow! And I photographed for five years before that. That's that's some chronicle. It's a lot of hearing loss. What's one of the what's say. one yeah, right. Yeah. What's uh what's one of the more, you know, with that much footage, obviously some great stuff had to didn't make the final cut. What's one, what's stuff. some of the some of the the better stuff that didn't get to make it into the movie? Well, it's funny you mention that because uh well, tomorrow night there's going to be a sneak peek all over the country in 100 markets, 100 theaters. That's um, awesome. And it's going to be at Regal Theaters and I'm showing uh five scenes of the film that didn't make it that I really love, my director's cut. Oh. Um, that's a one night only thing. And there's also Kyle Bush uh, did a great interview because he comes from a, his own little bull ring in Las Vegas, short track racing. Uh-huh. And um, he loved the film and he's, it's a, he gave a really beautiful interview just about short track and his life and how he eventually became hopefully this year's champion. But he's a you know great cup racer. Um, so what, what didn't make it in was, um, well, there's one scene where, um, it's a little argument ensued. Uh, somebody, take somebody into a wall and uh, you get into the pits and there's a little discussion that goes on. It's, it's a loud discussion. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff flies. Yeah. yeah a lot of stuff flies. That's, that's one scene. I mean, it's about, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, 10, 10 guys kind of settling up in the pits and you, but you see the, the slow build into exactly what happened. And then there's also a, a, a beautiful scene of a marching band that just, um, the marching band comes onto the track on 4th of July. It's a beautiful band all composed of everybody from the town picks up an instrument whether they can play or not mm. and they are the opening ceremony for 4th of July and I, I just had the camera set really in between them as they kind of went through it's like a one shot scene of this beautiful choreography of this marching band of just you know people local people regular people from the town with instruments that aren't necessarily tuned up perfectly Yeah, but uh, but a beautiful scene there's also another scene with Pastor Scott who he wears a fire suit that's racing for Jesus and uh, he prays with all the drivers. Every Jesus, driver I mean, Jesus on. would love NASCAR. Yeah, he and would. Stock, he, yeah. Would. And he, he really, was a, he was a racer back then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, he prays the drivers, every single driver, before they go onto the track. And uh, he's in the film. You see, is a sermon he gives, and his sermons are all about racing. Every sermon. So the the race does he have like start. a normal church? Or is it only the ra- Does he yeah. only preach at the track? Uh, no, he preaches at the church, but he preaches at the church only about racing. <laughs> That's it. I could get down on that. Yeah. So he's cool. So he's the the race doesn't start until he he does donuts on the track, in a comet. I mean the for the Lord. For the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> racing with Jesus. Yeah. He's uh, that's, that's, that's a scene you're going to see that didn't make it to the film, because uh, it just didn't fit. Yeah. 
I could have made it. My first cut of the film was three hours. Yeah, that's a long one. That was a long one. But yeah. is it you get you get attached to certain scenes? It's hard to hard oh my, to all, all the scenes. Yeah, to right. cut stuff down. You know, it's yeah. like the you want you want there to be a three hour cut because it's probably pretty. Yeah. It's probably good. Yeah. Well, I shot three hundred and sixty hours. That's a lot. And then the editor said to me, "Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pick out every scene you must have in the film. Yeah, hang it on the wall." And then uh, I'm going to come in in three hours and see what you put on the wall. So I, I you know, have frames of every scene. I had 1,260 scenes. <laughs> and she came in and said, "I'm not, I'm not, I'm not working on this project. Goes, We're going to have to cut this down <laughs> by done. two thirds." Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, you know, it's but this film is very unique in that it doesn't have a typical storyline. It doesn't have, um, you know, a typical antagonist protagonist. It does have a three act structure to it, but it doesn't have main characters. My main character happens to be a it's the track. track. Yeah, I don't have a, a human character, so the challenge was in editing this film is, you know, juxtaposing moments. Mm. I'm just immersing you into a place. It's a new way of filmmaking. I immerse you into this place and let you observe. There's not a lot of editing. Every scene is uncut. It's just you watch an announcer six minutes take you through a race because yeah. I want you to just observe how incredibly amazing this man is in his memory and what he's doing by announcing sponsors the audience I mean, he knows a lot and he's been doing that since there's really something to be said like I've done some announcing and stuff and the people who right. like know every driver personally and know everything about it I mean it's like it can only come it can't come from like memorizing a sheet you know you mm -hmm. have to have been there for a long long time and he's been sitting in that chair from 18 to 76 this guy was sitting in that same chair <laughs> from 18 years old to 76. Yeah. Like, oh, Jesus, yeah. What is? Incredible. Does it seem like the? Uh, what are the owners' names again? Barbara and Jim Cromedy. Does it? Does it seem that they've got a lot of patience left for this, or are they are they running out of steam? I think that it's waning. I think it's really difficult for them, especially their injuries. If you look at the last, uh, well, in the film you'll see. Uh, I track their their health through the film, and it and it you know it's hard. They. You know, you have a couple 87-year-olds that um, had both had strokes and, uh, and both broken their hips and can't take care of one another anymore. That's very difficult. And yeah. they're still keeping us alive. And they're keeping it alive not for the money, by the way. They're keeping it alive because they feel responsible to the community. And is, it, is there an option for, okay, their kids aren't into it, the developers are creeping in. Is, is there another option for the the community to raise the money and take over the track themselves? Is that no, that's a possibility? Well, the town, of course, doesn't want the track anymore. Right. They did want the track, but now the new administration doesn't want the track, you know, so, and they're pro-development. So that's that's not a positive thing. Um, no, the hope the hope is that they find somebody that, that they'll say, we'll sell it to somebody as long as they promise to keep it open as a racetrack. Otherwise, we're not selling it. And they're going <laughs> to, they just are not giving up. Yeah. So it's a really beautiful story about inspiration, perseverance. I mean, they, they uh, against all odds. I mean, I was in, I was with Barbara in the hospital. She had suffered a stroke, and uh, and I'm visiting her, and I said, "So is this? I mean, why are you going to continue this? Your kids? I've talked to them. They said just get out. You're, it's just not healthy for you anymore." And she just said, "Shut up, get out of here. I don't want to hear that negative thought. And I'll see you at the racetrack on Saturday." And you know what? She did. That's amazing. They just don't give up. That's amazing. But it's you know they feel. You know, it's important to the town. I mean, it, it's. Um, I think at first they were in it just as a business. They were just going to like they've been in the, in the. They had a hockey team before. They had um, roller derby. They had all these little. They had flea markets before, and this was supposed to be a two-year, you know, in and out business. But ended up doing it for thirty years or thirty-seven years, and um, they put on their NASCAR uniforms and they feel like they're one of the guys. I mean, this, they're just a racer. Yeah. Like she says in the film, I never raced a car before, but I'm, I know what it's like. And then she gets, the first time I saw her really get emotional is, um, is when she started to talk about what it's like to, for the, for the racing and the family. And she said, you know, she started to cry and she said, um, I don't know where you get a feeling like this, um, where somebody, a regular person, um, a mechanic he's a he's a has a shoe store gets into a car and races and uh and feels alive again i don't know where you get that and that's a very beautiful thing i mean what, where else in the what else can you experience like that where all four senses are going nothing i mean to me i i i really love racing cars i think it's yeah. i think it's just it's but to you smell? get to shut off the world yeah, you you the yeah the smells of race gas and the smell, rubber the and sight, all the hearing. Where can yeah. you get all that? Where can you get where can you get 
all that visceral experience. And it's legal. Yeah. Barely. Barely. Yeah. I mean, you'll never open a new, you'll, they'll never build a new racetrack ever. That, unless they're private. I mean, they, the new the new racetracks they build put in a desert, are they? private, and they're in the desert or in the middle of the woods, usually yeah. the desert. I mean, in here in California, they opened a new one not long ago outside mm-hmm. of Palm Springs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thermal Club. Yeah, in the desert. Private. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, private. Big, you know, membership. it's like, yeah, you got to buy a $2 million house, mm-hmm. then you can have it, then you can go. Yeah. But the, for the regular... You know they're, where it started. They're not opening Grease ovals. Monkeys. Nobody. Yeah. I mean, they're not. They're they're opening road courses for rich rich guys. Yeah. They're not opening ovals for locals. Yeah. Oh. There's no such thing as an oval in this country that's less than well, fifty that, years old. That's a shame. We'll have to hope with the movie that once people see it, especially non-racing people see it, they'll understand the importance of these in your town. There's 231 left, I think. Is that what it is? Ovals. 231. But there used to be 3600. <sighs> there's one. Um, there's one up at called. Uh, Glen Helen up here. Oh, yeah. Do you know that one? Oh yeah, it's a famous track. Yeah, and Glen Helen gets on uh, on on their you know whatever their Saturday night you know races are, soup, late modified or whatever they call them, mm-hmm. gets fifteen thousand spectators. Wow, that's amazing. That's crazy. That's great. A little but half, that's great. A little half mile. Yeah, but those modifieds go pretty fast. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're and, loud, and they're cool. I love and the uh, the sprint cars are are amazing too. There's some scary shit. Scary shit. <laughs> <laughs> the accelerator. The, they're pretty cool. The cra- You know, it's like 600 horsepower, no gears, yeah, no direct gears. drive, yeah. just just. And then you're straddling like, you know, a uh, a transmission basically. Yeah, that's it right. goes right between your legs. <sighs> those guys. It's nuts. It's great, but you know, but what happens when those things disappear? Yeah, what do you do? I don't know. It's you like what happens games. to yeah. what happens to like all the cars from the 30s and 40s, mm-hmm. like that aren't you know the there's like your cars that are like a million dollars, you yeah. know, and then we'll be in museums now. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, who who's gonna buy like a 46 Dodge? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like the, who, nobody gives a shit about that stuff yeah. anymore. They turn it to scrap. Yeah. So if it's a, you can make more bridges in China, right? All the infrastructure was from here was from scrap metal. Uh, yeah, that's what is it? Know. Well, that's uh, what they, all the junkyards here. The drivers always talk about how hard it is to find parts of their cars from the seventies because it was all sold for scrap. I'm not surprised. They went overseas. Yeah. Is there a, a, a secondary economy? They they, they make that stuff. <laughs> Where over there? I don't know. I don't know. Somewhere <laughs> they just make bridges. And yeah, I go to. I was like down in New Zealand, and like you know, every car club. It's like okay, you can weld and you can mm-hmm. cast aluminum and you can oh, do body work, and, and they pass they they pass all their shit around. You know, so there's one cool. there's one guy who covers everything. You know, and then they have they end up having like you know one guy for each thing. Uh, like, and good. they manage to get stuff done that's that good. way. It's good. Um, yeah. what are, um, you know, what are some of the, the other more interesting folks that can be found around this, around Riverhead? And you, you mentioned well, the announcer and of course the owners. Bob Fine, it's great. Well, you have Captain Video, who's uh, the track videographer. Okay. Uh, he's been doing it for 29 years now. He's a volunteer, like most of the people are. And what he does is he, f- he has an old video camera. That he takes very seriously, and he, he films how old the race. Are, how old are we talking? Like super eight old? Or? Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> pretty good. No, he's a first generation VHS camera. Oh my god. Yeah, but he th- he don't think it's a problem. So he uh, he films the race, and if you win, he records your speech, um, and then he comes back the next week and sells you a, a DVD <laughs> for a dollar. For own. But it takes he him. He probably raise his prices. Well, that's the thing. Well, he's, he's at home. You watch him. He labors. It takes him like three hours to edit this thing, by the way. He has the whole race. He puts in the, he, he has a cable attached to the announcer sound feed. And he makes this beautiful DVD for a dollar. But that give, that's his value of the track. That gives him purpose in life. Because during the week, he's a postal carrier. Yeah. And he just, you know, it's, it's not a great job. But then on the weekend, he's, the, he's Captain Video. Wears a uniform. He has a booth Is up there. Is there like a cape? Like is no, like, I want to like make that. him a cape. He wears mostly Hawaiian shirts. I don't know why, but he that does. works for Captain yeah. Video, yeah, actually. I think. Yeah, but he's always at the he's always at the front line. He hops over the fence as soon as the race is won. He gets your speech. He uh, you know tells you tells you to smile every time, and then uh, he goes in the pits. He's in the film. You see, he goes in the pits round and just delivers your DVDs. He's a really, I think he's a really beautiful character. I like him a lot, and of course, you know, I like uh, Pastor Scott. I think is gold. Have uh, have the folks in the movie seen it yet? They have. They went to see it. We uh, we we screened it in the Hampton Film Festival a couple mm. of weeks ago, which is only ten miles from the racetrack. Yeah, but it 
very different kind of community. I'm sure. I'm sure the people in the Hamptons Ooh. really were happy to see the Riverhead Raceway folks well, at their at the screen. Let me tell you. Let me describe this scene for you. <laughs> so it is outside the outside the West Hampton movie theater. There was about 400 people waiting outside, and the uh, festival manager at that location came up to me and said, "Look, we don't want any trouble here." <laughs> I said, "What do you mean?" He goes. We don't want any trouble here. I said, I heard you, but what's the problem? He said, that crowd outside. So he called security, of course, and, you know, and uh, we really were. It's like, they all have tickets, man. Yeah, Chill. I know. And it was great. I thought they really loved the film. They were cheering and uh, screaming, and it was cool. I well, think, the, I think the, they liked it. I think they liked seeing themselves on screen and realized. I'm sure they do. I mean, if they them. think they're, if they, if they feel like a rock star on a podium, you know, now they're, they're immortalized. On a big, you know? a big screen. It was like an 80 foot screen they were looking at themselves. Yeah. On. yeah. It was pretty cool. That's cool, man. Yeah. And I gave everybody a credit. I said, I said, if you stay to the end, you'll see every single person in this entire track has a credit in this film. Oh, I bet the IMDb folks love that. Ooh, I think I have the longest <laughs> end credits in the history of filmmaking. <laughs> I, like, I think it's 10% of the minutes. film, pretty much. <laughs> it just keeps going. That's awesome. Yeah. So now that uh, now that you've made a film about this, what is the, what's the next film? I'm working on a film right now. I just got back from Italy two days ago. I'm working on a film called The Hunt, which is about, very similar to this, in that, well, it's about uh, truffle hunters. That's cool. A uh, community of truffle hunters. They're 80 to 90 years old the last generation of truffle hunters in Northern Italy. Let me um, guess, their kids aren't super into truffle hunting. Just don't want to hike in the mud at <laughs> midnight for eight hours a night with a dog and no yeah. light. It just doesn't seem to be attractive to it. But, uh, but it's a beautiful, it's, a, it's another community on the edge of extinction. And um, you know, it's about passion. They're out there every single night. Imagine your grandfather, 85 years old, uh, walking 20 miles a night in the mountains. <laughs> in the dark. In the damp mountains, in the dark with no lights. With a with a little white dog looking for a fungus under a attached to an oak tree root. That's but if you exactly took that away from that eighty five year old guy, that's you right. know what I mean? You yep. you you could you couldn't even take it away from that's him. Right. That's that's his purpose in life, right? That's his. Uh, but there's that's no his one. There's nobody to to take over for them. That's it. Not really. I mean, we, we're, we're what learning. What are us is truffle that, eaters going to do? I know all of I'm, us. I know. You know, I'm not joking. I'm yeah, serious. I love. I, I love a truffle. And this is a white truffle too. This is this, like, this, is, this is the is good a, shit. You cannot cultivate these. They have them, hard to find. There's a restaurant down here that's got them, and you can add them. Now to, you can get this month. This is the month. Yeah, you can add them to any. It's like uh, the restaurant. This restaurant, Giorgio Baldi, that I love. It's like one of the best Italian restaurants in Los Angeles, they and them. you can get them added to any dish. Wow! But it's like. By $150 a, you know, a right. gram or something. It's like hunting for gold. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, oh, here's a bowl of pasta. It's like 24 bucks. That's an expensive yeah. bowl of pasta, but we can make it a $200 <laughs> bowl. <laughs> you just say the word, you know. Slice away. It's, well, it's a beautiful, it's, it's another beautiful community. They're, um, I've been filming there. I started, I filmed there for three months last, uh, last fall because it's seasonal. And then I went back, uh, let's see about four weeks ago filmed for three and a half weeks straight and then i'm going back november 26th to film for another four weeks and uh and we'll wrap up um well it'll be done by next fall so this is going to be your genre is is filming uh communities on the verge of extinction you betcha it's a good genre and actually i think so and it's also it's it's about immersion i'm, I'm going to you know the this film is similar to the last race and that it's going to be very cinematic mm. so i take my time with the shot we shoot one shot at one scene a day so they're beautiful scenes, and I'm going to immerse you in uh, this story uh, visually instead of with words. I'm not going to give you a history lesson like the last race. I don't have an announcer telling you about the history of the racetrack, history of racing. It's just I just, just let you figure it out for yourself. Well, that's guy guys walking in the woods for truffles. Yeah, like, just like just around. like they've been doing for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years is right. Yeah. yeah, and it's like it's just like hunting for gold. And then they, what's beautiful is they they sell them in the black market. It's the only way you can sell them. They go out four in the morning, and it's like a drug deal. They're on a, They're right behind it. The shadows of a church. Got stuff. Huh? You, got, you got the stuff. That's what they do. Imagine you got, you got the cash. Dude. You yeah. got the lira. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> were they not? Were they about you filming the, the shady part? They're cool. No. Oh, I cannot. I've tried. I cannot. Sh the the, uh, the deal of the truffle. They won't let me. Sh I, every time no? I show up the camera, they think I work for the government. That's so funny. The tax department. Oh. I said, really? Do I really look like a tax guy? I can't well, speak the language. In Italy, the taxes can be a little... Well, that's the problem. You know? They don't want to pay, they don't I, pay the I, taxes I was, there. <laughs> I was on a family vacation in Italy, mm. and we had a day trip to from Naples to uh, Positano mm -hmm. on, a, on wow. a lovely little 45-foot nice boat with a captain. It was great, that's right? A beautiful trip. They drop us off 
at uh, at uh, the restaurant, you know, mm-hmm. at the beach, and the boat's on anchor, just mm-hmm. sitting out there. The police roll up and oh. seize the boat. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> We're just stuck Whoa. there. We watched them. T- the owner of the boat wow. didn't pay taxes. And they seized wow. the boat. Oh, man. <laughs> We're, I mean, Vacation not that, that, not that yeah. Positano is a bad place wow. to be stranded, but we had to wait a while for them to send another boat. <laughs> well, that's a, yeah, that's a problem. Well, people, but the, that's, a lot of people don't pay taxes. The, I, they, they just kind of don't. They, well, they protest yeah. the government by not paying their taxes. Yeah, like so what they did, I think they paid 20% tax on food, so the government said it's a truffle hunt as well. How about 3%? And they said, no, my father hasn't paid, my grandfather hasn't paid, my grandfather, my great grandfather hasn't paid, I'm not gonna pay, so. But I think it's also cultural. They love the idea of, of doing things in the, in, the sh- you know, in the shadow of a church at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It's part of their shtick, <laughs> which is cool. Um, Although I wouldn't want my grandfather out dealing truffles at four in the morning. No. Uh, yeah. what, uh, you know, what can folks do you know, like if you've got one of these great kind of local tracks, aside from spectating, going and spectating, or 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 even better, you know, building a race car and yeah, showing up. Gotcha. You know, what do, what do people actually do about the 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 vanishing, you know, local businesses and local race tracks and. Well, I think it's good if you if you do have a mom and pop in your town, you should support the mom and pop. Obviously, it's better to support a local bakery than buying your bread from Walmart. Because what it'll probably taste better is, too. It'll it'll taste better. There's love in the bread instead of it made in some factory in the middle of nowhere. But that's part of the issue is that once you like in this town in Riverhead, most of the town is going to work for Walmart now, and Walmart of course pays you know not a living wage, yeah, and no health benefits, and then they give you a little discount, fifteen percent or something to. To you know, to buy your food there. So in essence, fucking just live and just yacht live in was just docked here in yeah, Marina Del Rey. Yeah. Well, the two hundred and ninety feet registering the Caymans. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the fucking three bitches, bullshit. the three richest women in the world. Yeah, is the, the Walton sisters, but just can't find their way to pay, give health insurance to their employees. It's very depressing. It shouldn't be allowed. How long do you think this racetrack's got left? Oh, I think once the uh, the film comes out and it uh, becomes hopefully. You know, more famous than it is, uh, it'll stay around for for years. Do you think this racetrack is? I mean, aside from being the last one on Long Island, I mean, do you think this is a mm, no, no, not a metaphor, but like you know, do you think this the situation and the characters and the people behind this racetrack? Do you think this could have been any oh, yeah. small oval? Oh yeah, well, it could have been any small town, any yeah. town that's. That's being annihilated from uh, development from big box stores. I think this is the story. I mean, it's not only it's not really about necessarily a racetrack, but it's about towns that are just um, under assault. Um, and what value it is to have places like this uh, exist. You know, it's it's no different than the, than your local bakery. I mean, the bakery, the diner. You know, wherever you'd sit and communicate with people about mm-hmm. what's new, what's happening in the town. Those things are all being eliminated by having just chains and box stores in your town. That's just not a good thing. I know. We see it in Europe too. I mean, we see it, we're working now in Italy. It's become, it's it's a similar story. I mean, where we're working now in, uh, no, in Italy, they're you know, deforesting, uh, they're taking all the trees down and they're replacing it with vines, with grapevines because it's more profitable, but what you do oh, is you just to make all everything. of Italy a vineyard yeah, pretty much. pretty much is. Pretty much is where we are, and but see, that, that is like, no I birds. Like Italian wine a lot. Yeah, Italian wine's, wine's for, good. Italian but wine's yeah. good. But 15, is this, but is this gonna be like? Enough. But yeah. is this gonna be like shitty commercial grade Italian wine and not the no, Italian wine that we know and good. love? Is it? No, it's pretty good wine. But the thing is, then no, you you've limited all what they're doing over there. We'll keep the truffles. We just we have enough. There's plenty of wine. But the problem is now there's no bees left. No bees. No birds. Oh yeah, the bees. Yeah, our honey. Honey is gonna be a real problem. Tons of pesticides. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So are we? Run, we're running out of honey. Isn't that a thing? Are we running out of honey? Running, running out of bees. Yeah. Bees and honey. And and the film you see in the last race, the guy explains about how bees work. You know, Tim Mulqueen explains. Well, you have to see, but he explains why. Is he a his, beekeeper? Well, he has a garden. He has a soft side. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only is he a race a race car driver, uh, a, a, you know, really aggressive one. He has a soft side where he grows berries in his garden, and he gives you a lesson why you need bees in your garden. Otherwise, you just don't have. Berries. Well, don't they pollinate everything and keep things going? That's what that's it is. A, that's it's a thing, poll- right? It's a lesson about pollination from yeah. Tim Mulqueen, race car driver. 
Car 77. You know who I respect? I just, you know, as this trailer cycles in your, in the background here, I, the, the corner workers, like track workers, and, Great. you know, a lot of these guys, they, they trade uh, labor for, tra- for track mm-hmm. time, and, and some yeah. of them just do it out of the goodness of their heart. It's amazing to me that these guys will just sit out in that little tower uh, I think all everybody day. has a volunteer. Almost everybody I know at that racetrack is a volunteer. The guys, the, the cleanup crew, Captain Video, of course. Um, no, he charges a dollar. Uh, that's a, that's that is, that, that is, is a capitalist. That's true. <laughs> that's true. He can sell five CD, DVDs a week. You're right. That's pretty good. No, but most of the people are here because they, uh, you know, it's a, it's attached to identity. They identify with uh, with being at this racetrack. I'm sure a lot of them think they're racers. A lot of them think they're going to make the big leagues. Even they're a maintenance guy. You yeah. know? But it's true. One of the guys, in the, um, this guy uh, CJ. It's his father and son. His father is the maintenance guy. He sweeps up whenever there's an accident. Um, and what he does, he just, you know, he's every cent he can scrap up, uh, scrape up, he he puts into his son's race car because he wants his son to race. It's not a great race car. It's getting there. Yeah. It's been three years. It's getting there. But he's, you know, picks up a carburetor, but it's not a, you know. The McLaren Scout yeah. is not there, you know. <laughs> not yet. I, is, there, is there a Ray yeah. Hall Letterman, you know, racing well, member? There is a there is a guy named Ryan Priest who just made the bigs. He's on, uh, he just got picked up by Hendricks. So he's oh, racing really? He's racing the bigs now. Ryan he was Priest. Modified. Ryan Priest, P-R-E-E-C-E. He's now a, just got a ride. Really? He was, Let's he was see. Modified. He's a big see guy what now. he's doing here. Ryan Priest. Oh, here he is. Look at him. This look is a that. Riverhead kid. This is a Riverhead guy, huh? Riverhead. Look at him. Look what he got. Hendricks, right? Yeah. Look at this. American he's professional stock car racing driver competes in the NASCAR Whelan Modified Tour, driving the number six Chevrolet but, for TS Haulers Racing and that's part-time for, in the Xfinity Series for Joe Gibbs Racing. That's right. Gibbs there just picked go. him up, gave him a ride, and now he's in the bigs. Look at this! No, on this past Saturday, he finished yeah. fifth. Yep, How good for him. good for this good for this guy. Good that? for Ryan. How about that? And he started at go karting in Riverhead. There you go. Started at seven years old. I mean, that's, you know, that's, Mario that's how they started start. That, Mario that's, Andretti raced at that racetrack. That's how they all start. Yep. Oh, he's got, look at this. He's got a good, oh, he's got a, mm-hmm. he's got a fully, he's like a whole like he's grocery got, store yeah, he's the, aisle. He's got a Velveeta. He's got, he's <laughs> got Kroger, Cheerios. He's got a, a whole breakfast, <laughs> you know, thing happening. This dude, this is some Ricky Bobby shit right here. This guy. Good for him. Good for you, Ryan. Respect, sir. They, they don't have enough decals on their uh, stickers on there. It's a good-looking race outfits. car. Oh, he's yeah, got a good-looking good race looking car. car. Although it's really weird. Is there Cheerios on the back? Yeah, you got Cheerios, Velveeta. Oh. If you combine all that shit Oof. into one, it'd be weird. It's know. really weird that they're doing the Camaro uh, and Mustang front ends on yeah. the NASCAR now, because that these proportions just don't look right. Yeah, well, that's NASCAR for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why I like street stocks myself. Yeah. Yeah, do you, is that is that is that your race? That you're I love street stocks because it's entry level. You know anybody can do it. Five hundred bucks in a junkyard, you got yeah. yourself a car. Do you have you cool. are you familiar with uh, with the twenty four hours of lemons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that we do a lot of that out here. Yeah, yeah, I know. And cool. uh, and and I race in a series called American Endurance Racing. Oh really? Which is yeah, it's like a half a bump wow. up from that. It's not the the you know in, in lemons the cars are like a joke. Yeah, yeah, you know they theme them like a chicken or yeah. a fucking upside down speedboat or some shit. You know they make him real ridiculous. In, in the one I race in, in AER, the uh, the cars are still pretty cheap, but they are supposed to look normal. Well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so when but, are you doing that next? I just did a race in Ohio last wow. uh, month. Did oh, not go cool. well. Oh, didn't go. <laughs> we didn't crash, but it didn't. We broke a bunch of shit. It didn't go well. But it's um. That's cool. You know, wow. but I I do think for the for the trouble. You know, obviously the what your point in your film is is about the small business being killed off by the big business mm-hmm. and and that kind of stuff. On the other hand, uh, cheap racing in general, especially mm-hmm. if you're into road courses, mm-hmm. it's never been a better time to yeah. to go cheap. Cheap racing than right now. Yeah. There's between ch- uh, Chump Car, which you know, yeah, Chump Car, yeah. You know, they just bought the rights to Champ Car. Really? The actual. Wow, so Chump Car is now wow. actually called Champ Car. Wow. That's and cool. uh, That's great. and you know, you Lemons Champ Car. There's another one called Lucky Dog. There's um, that one, yeah. W uh, uh, W W R L World Racing League. Mm, uh oh. 
<laughs> there's another one I can't remember. But there's a few. Um, there's that's a good. few uh, options. Yeah, if you want to do cheap racing now, that's yeah. good. It, 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 there that's are for affordable which ways. Is great. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because NASCAR Cup racing, you gotta have some. Oh yeah, I mean anything that's quote professional is super super huge dollars. Yeah, but guys, well, those cars and even expensive. like fuck the cheap racing is kind of expensive still. I mean, well, tires are a lot of money. Yeah, tire even tires for a Miata. You yeah. know, or it can be a thousand, a thousand bucks, bucks a weekend. It's a yeah. thousand bucks. I did notice that for for all the shittiness of these guys' cars, they do seem to run Hoosier real, tires. They run Hoosiers. Yeah, they run. Yeah, it costs them seven fifty a weekend. Yeah, that's a lot of money. It, but it, that it, this thing is, these cars are really like a cage and good tires and pretty much nothing else. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much <laughs> it. Pretty much and sneakers. It. That's it. Uh, yeah. So the movie comes out November sixteenth. In theaters and on demand. Is You said 100 yeah. theaters? Is that what you said? Well, 100 theaters tomorrow night is a sneak preview. Oh, man, that's rad. Tomorrow night. It's where does it happen in L.A.? Uh, I think, you know? uh, oh, shit, I don't know where, but you have to look at the last race, the film. It, dot com. It's the oh, yeah, there. last race. Oh, here we go. Special screenings. I'll pull it up. Yeah, that's it. The last race, the film. Oh, dot com. There it is. See? And, oh, here we go. There you go. Where are we there? Edwards. Yeah, there it is. Irvine Spectrum. Oh, we've, we've somehow ended up in Orange County. You think in L.A.? Mm, oh. oh no! No, well, LA, you gotta wait for for Friday night. All right, but look, if we, if I night. zoom out, will there be all over? No, Ocean County. Well, how far? Oh yeah, here we oh, go. There you go. Well, most places that have, <laughs> if you're in a blue state, <laughs> you're, you're in good luck. In the red <laughs> states, maybe not so much. But uh, yeah, I don't know how that happens. Certainly in New York. North yeah. Carolina, Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, your major Florida. cities. All yeah. your major cities. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then on demand, what? iTunes? iTunes, I, uh, Amazon, a whole bunch of places. That's fantastic. Yeah. I really like, and I really like the uh, the, the poster with oh, this, this smoldering Monte Carlo. Yeah, that's a, I took that picture, and that's really it's what it was. It's a good picture. Yeah, I like that. That's the way it is. Can you get me, can you get me a movie poster? I'd, I'd love, I'd love to this. rock a movie poster yeah, of that. Looks, that's, a, that's a dope one. I'll get you put it up next to our Senna poster here. Cool. Senna's a great film. Have you seen Senna? We had, oh, yeah, uh, we had Asif on the, on the oh, show. Yeah, and many times. God, that movie rules. Do you like? Do you have any other uh, racing documentaries that you're into? Uh, not docs. Well, I like. Um, I guess I like Le Mans. It's not a racing mm. doc. I like Le Mans Grand, oh, man, Grand almost Prix. Is, yeah. yeah, almost Grand Prix. I think is a really beautiful film. I yeah, it's shot. I mean, it's kind of cheesy, but but it's shot beautifully. And then um, Days of Thunder. Believe it or not, I I studied that to see how it was shot. Days I, of I Thunder it a lot. rules. It's it's they shot that. I don't know how, but it's there's tough. a couple movies. Anytime they're on television, yeah. I'm stopping. Days of Thunder, you have to watch it all. The time. Any Back yeah. to the Future film, Great. stopping. Yeah, yeah. Days exactly. of Thunder, stopping. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No. And ha here, one of my favorite ones I just I always like to drop is a movie just called One. What is that? It's film? just the number one. It's a documentary uh, from uh, 2013. And here I'll just pull up the IMDb page. It's oh, a, it's a, a cool it's a fantastic. Uh oh, we have an ad. Oh look out! Oh no, robot. We've got an ad. Transformer. I don't know what happened here, but this oh, is it. Is. It's a, it's just the number one, mm. and it's, uh, it's about uh, it's the evolution brief. of Formula one. safety in Formula One racing. But it's, ah. it's really fast paced, wow. really exciting. Uh, check it out. It's uh, narrated by Michael Fassbender. Oh, wow. Does a really, really good job. That's cool. And uh, this is one of my, one of my favorite racing docs uh, to watch. I've, I've okay. got it on my computer. I probably watched it. A hundred times. I'll check it out. Uh, that's a really good one. I, okay. it, it's if you like Senna, then yeah, you'll no, definitely so like uh, one also. So but not story. to take away from your documentary, the last race uh, is uh, in theaters the sixteenth. Michael Dweck, thank you very much for joining. Oh, Thanks. come on! Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me, man. I appreciate Thanks it. Anything else you want to plug before we get out of here? Um, no. What else? No, that's it. Just come see the movie and uh, you know say nice things. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm gonna I'm gonna get it on on demand. I'm gonna have a look at it too. I I uh, I like the the trailer looked great, and uh, I can't wait to watch it. Well, thanks, man. I thanks for coming it. on the show. The Smoking Tire Podcast is powered by Shout Engine. Get your own damn podcast at shoutengine.com. It's easy. All you need is a microphone, a connection to the internet, and preferably something to say. Thank you very much. See you guys later. Bye. Thanks.